So at this point, we have created an attachment system, and we've put it to good use by creating an extension of the attachment class to sidearms and applied those sidearms to our ship. But our sidearms are missing some key functionality. These sidearms need to, well, act as weapons, and at the moment, they don't fire. As a matter of fact, Logan, go ahead and run the game real quick. And Logan's going to give you a quick review. As you can see, he's firing there, and you'll notice that our sidearms, they're just, they're just kind of hanging out. I mean, they're children, but, and they can get destroyed, but they don't fire. Now, let's think about these attachments for a second. These attachments are ships. If you recall, we extended ship to attachment, as you can see right there, and then from attachment, we went down to sidearm. Now, with a ship, we have a start fire, a stop fire. We have a uh, – there you go. Logan's pulling up. Start fire, stop fire. We have a fire action and a weapon available a little bit higher up. There we go. That means our sidearms have all of these weapon system elements available, so we need to put them to use. So the very first thing we need to do is set up a weapon and a fire action for the sidearms. So right. let's go and do that first. That's the first thing that comes to mind is if we start needing to set up, okay, well, this is a sidearm. It is a ship. We know that ships can have weapon systems. We've seen them on player. That's the very first thing to do is, okay, let's give the sidearm class weapon functionality. Now, weapon functionality is, of course, going to consist of a combination of a fire action, such as bullets. As a matter of fact, I think bullets are the only thing available. <laughs> right. And then some kind of weapon to determine how they are fired. So let's begin with fire action. And let's set that to a new instance of the fire action delegate, and we'll feed in projectile bullet dot fire bullet. So that is the action that should be carried out in firing. Next, we've got the weapon. So this sidearm's weapon can be a new instance of weapon auto. We'll give the sidearm's automatic weapons, and we should be able to tell these apart from the wave style weapon, as we should see a straight line of projectiles from the sidearms instead of the wave from the main ship. Okay. And in instantiating the weapon auto, we, of course, need a, an instance to ship so that the weapon can do things like position itself. We'll put in the this instance of the sidearm. And for the fire interval, I'm actually feeling kind of lazy, so I'm going to hard code in the value 0 0.1. <laughs> but we've I'm sure we've, by now we've seen how to make numbers into configuration values. Yeah, for sure. All right, so at this point, our two sidearms now have a weapon associated with it, if you will, basically a fire action and a weapon to control timing and all. But we don't yet have a way to actually fire our weapon. If we run the game once again, you'll see that we are still not firing from our sidearms. So now let's think back to how we actually trigger a weapon to fire projectiles. If you recall, all the way back on player where we had the input management system, if we scroll down, when you press the fire button, so there we've got process input, the fire button press, first happening for keyboard input, and does this. Remember, the fire button is the Z key, so here at the Z key, what actually happens? This dot ship, that is the player's player ship instance, and you see there, player ship, that is the instance to which start fire, excuse me, That's for right. which start fire is called. So start fire is called, stop fire is called. Now our ship is a ship. Our sidearms are also ships, meaning that they have a start fire and a stop fire. So all we need to do is gain access or invoke the start fire on our sidearm, and since our sidearm has now been set up with a weapon and a fire action, it will dispense projectiles. But how do we go about reaching our sidearm's start fire functionality? That's a good question. I mean, right now, we're kind of working at the top level, at the root. It's our ship itself. So when we simply say this dot ship dot start fire, we're talking about our ship's fire. How are we going to gain access to our children? Well, our children have been set up privately. So right now, we don't even have access to them, though we could go about hacking the system that we've got together to provide access. But even then, it gets a little bit more complex because it would be very easy to just access our first child. And we know our first child at the moment is simply a sidearm, so that would work well. But what happens if the that child had something parented to it, meaning another type of power-up that gave you another sidearm. So now you had a missile-launching sidearm and a laser-launching sidearm. Well, now we need to be able to walk down through the hierarchy, calling all of our children that are attachments, calling their start and stop fires. So this is not the place right here in player to try to set up some sort of system that would allow us to do that. But we already have something in place that's going to make this very simple. Logan, if you jump over to the node class real quick, 
in the node class, if you everyone recalls, we created this perform method with the infamous incorrect spelling that has now been corrected. And actually, the spelling was right. It was preform. Do you see what I'm getting but, at? Is, yeah, it was. It was it's before the form takes place. It wasn't. Bef- <laughs> it wasn't the description of the verb that one would be expecting. It was an adjective to describe something that had been preformed, as in it was about to be formed into something else. You got it, and that's exactly how we're about to put this to good use. And you, though you could, in a very abstract sense, argue that that was partially the intended <laughs> meaning, the actual verb is indeed perform and not preform. That's right. So, what happens inside of uh, perform? Well, one, it takes in a delegate, and it takes in events, okay, or arguments, basically, event args. So we have the ability to pass functionality and to perform as well as some of our own arguments, and then we are going to call upon the functionality that we pass in on the given node, okay? But then here's what's really nice. From there, we then walk the hierarchy, continuing to call each children's perform, So each child gets to execute the delegate that gets passed in. So we get to simply walk down through the entire hierarchy, calling functionality on every given node. Exactly. It's the ability to take in a delegate and then invoke that delegate for each instance that is a child at the current of the current level. So take an entire branch of the hierarchy and execute the delegate for each node in that hierarchy. So if you're thinking about it, you might right now we're saying, hey, well, this here gives us a means to pass functionality to every single ship in the hierarchy. And that's exactly what we're looking for. We need to call upon start fire and stop fire on every single ship that makes up our player ship. So if we were to put together some sort of functionality that said, hey, on the particular node I'm on, if we're a ship, call it start fire and then pass that functionality over to perform at the top level, then we're going to call every single ship and check to make sure that every single thing in that hierarchy is indeed a ship, and if it is, we'll call upon it Starfire. Now, why am I saying we need to make sure it's a ship? Well, the system is very flexible right now. We could extend game nodes into some sort of attachments that don't require any sort of weapon system or any of the other functionality that's been set up along the ship path of this hierarchy of classes. Imagine something as simple as a support beam, something that is meant to give a physical, visible connection between actual weapon arsenal and the ship itself. But you would, let's say you wanted that support beam to be an active game node such that if you destroyed the support beam, that entire wing of attachments would go with it and get destroyed. But you don't want it to have a weapon and fire action and all that good stuff. Exactly, but since it's part of the hierarchy, in order that, another interesting implication is the fact that in order to reach the sidearms, you have to walk to and past that called a blank game node to get to the other nodes. So if we were to simply walk through each node in the hierarchy and ask that node, hey, are you a ship? And if the answer is yes, all right, well, start fire, stop fire, you know, then that's going to give us the functionality we're looking for here. And we'll safely know that the particular node we're dealing with supports start and stop fire. So that is what we're going to do. We're basically going to set up a start fire and a stop fire in a more generic sense that we can then package up and send through perform. And that start fire and stop fire will call on each ship that it gets passed through start fire and stop fire. Now, this code that we're talking about to give these methods, which can be passed to perform, they are ship oriented. And that is meaning that their purpose is to call start fire and stop fire on ships. So the first thing that might come to mind is to go to the ship class and set up just methods just like that, methods that would satisfy the event handler method signature. But the problem with doing that is I wish to call these methods start fire and stop fire and methods named such already exist in ship, not to mention the fact that that would start to kind of blur the line between, well, which is the method to really start fire which is, versus which one is the one used as a pass-through inside of perform. So in order to clarify things, we're actually going to make a separate class, a static class all on its own, called recursive ship fire. That is simply an organizational level to put everything, basically to give the supplemental recursive code for ship firing and put it in its put it off to the side it's meant to be used in conjunction with ship but it clarifies some of the naming issues with already having start and stop fire methods now we can go ahead and take a look at doing that as a matter of fact only the methods themselves are required for it to work so let's put this recursive ship fire action into place and see how we can tie it into the input so what we'll do is we'll go over to game 
we'll add a new item, and this item is going to be called recursive ship fire. Recursive ship fire source file. Now we'll clean up the. I'm gonna call it recursive ship fire or just recursive ship. Uh, that's a good point. Recursive ship. I was apparently thinking fire and didn't type it. To correct that, I'm very quickly going to rename the class recursive ship fire, and then refactor the class name into recursive ship fire, and all should be well. Okay, cool. Once again, we'll make sure that the sub namespace is cleaned up, and we should be able to move on from here. There shouldn't be any uh, using issues we need to address. Now the recursive, all of the methods, everything inside of recursive shipfire is going to be static. So from the beginning, I'm going to mark the whole class as static. And then inside of the class, again, the very first things we need are start fire and stop fire functionality. But this is a start fire, which can be packaged up as a delegate and passed through the nodes perform. So let's take a look at that. This is what we're actually passing. We're passing an event handler and that means we need to match the method signature. Just for a very brief review on what that signature is, let's go to the definition of event handler. We can see that that method signature is an object followed by event args. So that is the method signature that we need. That means over here in recursive shipfire, let's start this special startfire method. We'll make the method public. It'll of course, need to be static. The return type will be void and the method name will be start fire. Now to satisfy that event handler method signature, we'll take in an object, which we'll call sender, and we'll take in event args, and we'll call that E. Now inside of the method body, once again, the whole purpose of this is to be able to, as we described before, call start fire for each node in a hierarchy. Now, on the other side of that explanation, now on the other side of for each node, was that, what does that mean? The other side of that is, if we're on the called side, that for each node implies that nodes will be passed into this method via sender. This is the point at which we get to see the node in question that we're working on. But this isn't a node yet. It's of type object. That means we need to attempt to cast it to ship, actually. And if we can indeed, if this sender is indeed a ship class, then we know we can call it Starfire. If it's not a ship, we'll simply do nothing because the recursive portion is already handled by perform. That means if we do nothing here, then the existing recursive code will continue on to other nodes that may possibly be ships. So the code here is simply going to be to store a ship variable, attempt to cast sender a ship, and if that cast resulted in something other than null, we know we have a ship and we know we can call Starfire. So let's make a local variable of type ship, which we'll call ship, and we'll initialize it to sender casted as ship. Then we'll turn around and do a check and say if ship is not equal to null, then we can call ship's start fire method. So really, that's all there is to it. It's just all a matter of understanding how and where this gets called from and how nodes get passed through. Now, along with start fire, we of course need to be able to treat stop fire in the exact same manner. Of course, of course, the firing system is based on starting firing and then at some undetermined point in the future, stopping the fire. So we need to be able to send a stop fire call recursively in the same manner. Now, since stop fire is essentially the same thing with just a different method call, I will copy and paste to duplicate the start fire method and simply change the name to stop fire. Then when we get down to determining that we have a ship, we'll call that ship's stop fire method. And then we have the possible things that can be passed through. Again, the code is almost identical except for the call to stop fire. Now that we have these methods, we can go ahead and actually test these in conjunction with the input and the perform method. Now it's not quite as efficient as we need it to be, but it will work. And we'll discuss the efficiency issue after we've got a test in place. To test this, we'll jump back over to player and let's replace our call to fire, where we're directly calling start fire. Let's instead treat ship like a node and call perform. In order to call perform, we need to pass the action to perform, which is really that delegate that we need to perform. And what is the action that we're trying to accomplish? Well, we're trying to accomplish recursive ship start fire. So we'll do that by looking into recursive ship fire and we can access the start fire method. Now for the event args, we aren't actually using those in the method, so we can safely pass in a value of event args.empty. 
Then we'll do the exact same thing for stop fire. As a matter of fact, I'll copy that line, move down to the release of the Z key, and paste this in for stop fire, simply changing the method used to recursive ship fire dot stop fire. So as long as you keep everything in focus here, this is not difficult. Logan hits the fire button. When he hits the fire button, it calls on that ship's perform functionality. And the perform functionality simply takes in some sort of functionality. In this case, we're sitting in recursive ship fires start fire functionality. And now perform is going to walk through all of the children handing off start fire, basically performing start fire on each of our children. So we can run and test. We see that now if we hit fire, we see projectiles from both of the sidearms. Very nice. So we have indeed established a scenario where fire can be passed through. And really quickly, we can do, um, as, as you were already saying, a review of how this is working, calling ship.perform with this functionality. Well, what does that look like inside of Node? Inside of Node, we see that, okay, well, action is going to be that call to start fire. So what happens? Invoke start fire for the given node. And then invoke, rerun the method recursively. So we end up invoking that delegate over and over again each time passing in a different node that is a node that's part of that hierarchy. Now on the recursive ship fire side, remember this being a node is passed in to start fire. Sender is now a node that instance. We cast it back to ship and if it was indeed an actual ship, not just an average node, then we can call start fire for that ship. So here is where start fire ends up being called for all nodes in a hierarchy. But I'd also mention something about an inefficiency. And where does that come in? Well, notice that I used the shorthand for defining the actual delegate instance here. I had simply dropped a method into the perform call where perform was looking for an event handler. So this code is actually equivalent to new event handler. And then passing in the method to the event handler. But you can actually run that and show it's exactly the same. So now if we run, we see that, yes, everything does indeed work. The sidearms still work in the exact same fashion. But this more clearly shows what the inefficiency is. So when does this event handler get instantiated? Every time the Z key is pressed. Is that really necessary to reinstantiate a new event handler? Well, not really. It's the same code. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's probably a new instance of it in memory, but it's, it's the same code. There's no reason to reinstantiate it. So what we could do is we could store an event handler. So instantiate this event handler, but store it somewhere statically so that every time we need to use it, we can just reuse the same instance and not have to reinstantiate it. A good place to store that event handler would be back in recursive shipfire. So to do that, what I'll do is I'll jump up a few lines and let's make just such a field. We'll make a public static field. The so public static event handler and we'll call this event handler action underscore start fire. So that way it's easier to think of this as a start fire action. Then we'll initialize that to a new instance of event handler. And we'll have that event handler point at the start fire method. So which is, of course, this method. Now, in order to do the same thing for stop fire, we can simply duplicate that line, make an event handler field called action stop fire, and point that at the stop fire method. All that should build. We can turn our attention back to player and put this into use by saying recursive ship fire dot action underscore start fire. And then the same for stop fire. We could say action underscore stop fire. Very nice. Now if we run, we see that, yes, everything is indeed still working. And there's another thing we can clean up real quick too, and that is when you do the recursive ship fire dot, and then we get our little pop up there, which start fire are you supposed to use? <laughs> exactly. We have an action start fire, and we have a start fire. And we've just shown that both of them have the same visual result. But we no longer need to access start fire and stop fire externally from the recursive ship fire class. So we can simply make them private. As a matter of fact, it would not be a good practice to do that anymore because it's less efficient than using That's action start fire. So we can very quickly clean that up by simply making start fire and stop fire private inside of the recursive ship fire class. 
And doing this means that if we are outside of recursive shipfire, all we see are the actions. Very nice. So it's now very clear which one should be used. And we have our functionality, and we have our functionality cleanly packaged into recursive shipfire, and we have instantiated delegates for efficiency. Of course, we're missing that functionality on the fire button of our controller, so let's go ahead and get that into place. If yep. I were to spawn one of the controller-based ships, we can see that we don't have our items firing. This is, of course, because the button's input for fire is handled later in code, where we're still accessing the single ship. So that can be very quickly addressed by simply copying and pasting the functionality from the keyboard Z key up and down to the gamepad A button up and down for start fire and stop fire actions. Now, if we grab our ships via controllers, ah, there we go. We have nice. full sidearm-based firing. So, very nice. So, what's really cool is if you think about it, what we have just allowed ourselves to do is to make method calls in a recursive fashion. So we can make a single call that results in a recursive call to all children giving specific functionality. Excellent. So now we can set something up very similar to handle explosions. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, we've got explosions, but we're missing one thing. And that is if our ship, the main ship, gets destroyed, all of the children's ships don't show any sort of explosion effect right now. So once again, we can recursively walk through all of our children and call their explodes. Let's go ahead and give them a quick review, Logan, on how explode works. We'll go ahead and first demonstrate the problem. All right, if I collide with enough things to kill the ship, watch Watching. the sidearms, they simply disappear. We don't get that little explosion ring effect when they get destroyed. But we've now, we now have a way that we can call a method for an entire hierarchy of nodes. So let's take a look at what we would need to do well, with let's, Explode. Let's see where Explode gets called right now. Well, if we go back to Game Node, mm -hmm. inside of the Game Node class, we have this Explode method. And it's calling Explode, which in turn calls the new effect node, which gives the explosion sprite and sheet. And calling Explode, we have Take Damage. So up here in Take Damage, this is where we get the call to explode. This is why a node being struck by an asteroid results in ex an explosion, because it is that specific sidearm taking damage results in an explosion call, and we see the explosion sprite sheet. When the ship is destroyed, remember how remove functionality works back in Node. Let's go up just a little bit to remove. Remove marks it as dead, taking it out of gameplay, and then recursively calls remove. Never calling explode. So that means when the main ship is destroyed, back over in game node, let's say looking at this from the main player ship, we make our call to explode, our call to remove, all of our children get calls to remove, none of our children get calls to explode. So for the explosion effect, it would be nice if we could call that recursively for all children. Now we would see the effect for all children, then we would do the remove and everything else would get silently removed. So how to set this up? Well, we know we can leave this method alone, much like in Shipfire. Right? Let me add this real quick. I just want to say that what we're going to do is basically the exact same thing we did for getting our sidearms to fire, for calling stop, start fire and stop fire. In this case, we just need to call upon explode. But uh, this time around, we're going to keep everything contained inside of game node. That way they've kind of had a right. taste of two different approaches to... Right, since in this case, there's and there's two reasons for doing that. One, we've already seen how this can work, so we've got a better picture of how a scenario of recursive method calling works. Two, the explode scenario is actually more simplistic. It's mm -hmm. actually 50% <laughs> as complicated. One less call. We have one call to explode. There is no such thing as start, explode, and stop, explode, where we had start, fire, and stop, fire. Right. So that means we only need one call and one field to handle the, uh, the reference to that call. So all the code is going to be done inside of game node just to keep the number of classes down. So that means to use that same system, we need two things. We need a method that can be passed, that can be packaged into a delegate and passed to perform. So we need a method that takes in the method signature object and event args. So what I'll do is inside of game node, just after explode, we'll make a new static void method called explode. And we'll, we'll change the method signature of this, because right off the bat you would start to see a problem where we have two methods named explode. This method's signature is going to differ, which will allow us to put this into place. We'll have a method signature matching that of an event handler. So that is object sender and event args e. So even though it's a completely separate method, because this one is in fact static, the compiler lets us get away with this because we have 
a different signature altogether. Mm -hmm. And that allows us to simplify the naming by simply allowing us to reuse the name explode. Now, explode needs to do have some code very similar to recursive Starfire. That is, we're taking in an object, but the only things that can explode are game nodes. So we're going to need to cast that over to a game node. I'll make a game node local variable called node, and we'll initialize that to the sender casted as game node. And if that cast resulted in something other than null, so now if that node variable is not equal to null, then we know that an explode has been called with a game node as the sent parameter. And that means that game node can have an explode method call. Okay. Now, since we don't want to reinstantiate this every time something explodes, let's make a static field. So static event handler. We'll call this event handler action underscore explode. And that keeps with our naming structure we've begun, and that is the reference, the static reference to a method being action underscore. Also, that goes hand in hand with the perform method itself, where perform refers to the delegate as the action to perform. So that action explode is going to be equal to a new instance of event handler. That new delegate will point at the explode method. So with these in place, that means we should now be able to change the original call to explode into a call to perform, which recursively calls explode. So let's change this to this.perform. We wish to perform the action, action underscore explode, the new field we just made. And we'll leave the event args set to event args empty because once again, we are not using event args. And with all that in place, let's build and test. So the goal here is to crash the ship as quickly as possible. There were under 50 health, so the next asteroid should take the ship out. And hey. both sidearms have the ring-style explosion. Very nice. So now explosions are, in general, on game nodes, simply performed recursively. Excellent. And that goes, once again, hand-in-hand -hand with the fact that once they explode, they're removed anyway. So just due to the hierarchical nature of remove, that means we always have everything showing its explosion effect when it, when it explodes. Though just to point this out, you may be thinking that, okay, well, wouldn't that be undesirable if I wanted, let's say I wanted things to be able to disappear invisibly with no effect. Always remember that inside the individual game nodes, that means things like sidearms, you have the option of not setting an explosion sprite sheet. All you would have to do is, would be to not have an explosion sprite sheet. And when explode is called, no explosion is shown. And that actually shows the advantage to leveraging the already existing explode function, since this same original explode function is the thing that is in the end called, that already has to check to make sure that we have an explosion sprite sheet before attempting to show the effect. We also note that explode is still virtual, so that means in subsequent classes of game note, all you would have to do would be to override explode, and you could still end up leveraging the recursive functionality. That's right. Now, one last thing to do as a cleanup step inside of game node is the fact that this action explode field is just muddled down here with all of the methods. It would probably be cleaner to move that back up with the rest of the fields at the beginning of the class. I originally created it side by side with the method just to make it abundantly clear that those two go together. But now that we know how they're working in conjunction with each other, we can move the field up into the fields at the beginning of the class and then leave the explode method down with all of the other methods. So we'll build one final time, one final review, and that is we have sidearms that can fire. And then once the ship is destroyed, we see any of the necessary explosion effects applied recursively. Excellent. Now the system can be easily extended for creating all sorts of different sidearm type attachments for our ship. And this brings the creation of attachments to a close for Space Fighter as far as we're going to demonstrate it. I think we're going to take a break away from weapons for a little while and add some stars in. That would be really cool and maybe uh, spiffy up the screen just a little. Then uh, at the very end, maybe revisit, make some uh, seeking missiles. That would be kind of cool. And that will wrap up all of Space Fighter. But at this point, that's going to wrap up our sidearm attachments, and we'll see you in the next video.